Good morning, everybody. My name's uh, Michael Lestrange. I'm the director of the uh, National Security College uh, here at the ANU. And on behalf of the, the college and the Australian New Zealand School of Government with whom we're hosting this occasion, can I extend to all of you uh, a very warm welcome and a uh, warm appreciation for your support of this occasion this morning. Working breakfasts are not a usual Australian means of doing business, certainly not as much as they are in the United States. Um, but this occasion has generated a lot of interest uh, and we're delighted to be co-hosting it uh, with Ansel, uh, with whom we now share uh, new premises down the road. For us and for Ansel, this is an important occasion uh, for a number of reasons. Um, it's the first time that we've co-hosted uh, a function like this with ANZOG um, as co-tenants of the new building and we very much look forward to uh, doing many of these in the future, but this is the first of the new era. Uh, the second reason is that uh, we have a visitor of uh, such a distinguished background and such expertise uh, as Michelle uh, Flournoy this morning and we really thank her for her presence. Uh, and we very much look forward to her remarks. The third reason is that the focus of her discussion this morning um, are issues of great importance to Australia, to the Asia Pacific and to the world um, as the second Obama administration takes shape. So the topicality uh, this morning is very focused and, and explains in part, I think, uh, the great interest in this occasion. And the other reason why it's important is that it brings together um, a wide range of interested people uh, from across the Canberra community, uh, from government, from business, uh, and in that connection can I express a particular appreciation uh, to the Boston Consulting Group who have uh, been so helpful in organising uh, this occasion this morning. Uh, the diplomatic community, uh, and in that context, can I acknowledge the presence of the, the Dean of the Diplomatic Corps, the Ambassador of Argentina here this morning. Uh, many people uh, from both the public and the private sector. So a warm welcome to you all. Um, I hope you enjoy the occasion. And I'd now like to ask Peter Allen, the Deputy Dean at the Australian New Zealand School of Government, uh, to introduce Michelle. Thanks very much, Michael, and um, if I can add my um, welcome to our many distinguished guests. Um, this is, uh, it's hard to think of a better way to um, kick off the partnership between the National Security College and the Australian New Zealand School of Government than the seminar this morning. Um, as Michael mentioned, we've just recently moved into a new building, uh, which the Australian Government um, built to uh, provide both a home for the National Security College and the capacity for increased ANSOG presence in the national capital. Um, we have, um, as Michael mentioned, um, special thanks to give to Boston Consulting Group for making our very distinguished guest available to us this morning. Um, Boston Consulting has had a very distinctive role in ANSOG's creation um, they were there at the beginning and cons consulted across Australia and New Zealand um, and identified a real willingness on the part of governments to collaborate uh, to create um, a school that provided training for um, emerging leaders in government um, to come together across Australia and New Zealand. Uh, and this is now 10 years and Coincidentally, um, Boston Consulting have actively uh, supported uh, the review that's currently going on within ANSOG of what we've got to learn from the first 10 years of um, our operations in Australia and New Zealand. Um, but we are here today um, in the presence of someone who um, brings enormous um, experience and perspective uh, to the discussion this morning. Um, Michelle Fournay has been, is now a senior advisor to the Boston Consulting Group, um, but she came to that role from, um, as her previous role as Under Secretary for Defence for Policy, 
the third ranking official um, in the office of the Secretary of Defence. In this capacity, she served as a principal advisor to the Secretary in the formulation of national security and defence policy, oversight of military plans and operations, and in the National Security Council deliberations. She also represented the departments in dozens of foreign engagements in the media and in Congress. Um, she came to um, that role um, with a, 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 what might also be described as an entrepreneurial background almost, um, co-founding the Centre for New American Security, um, which was a non-partisan think tank dedicated to developing strong, pragmatic and principled national security policies. Um, she served as Centre's President until returning to government service in 2009. Um, we plan to ask Michelle to speak for about 25 minutes and then open it up for, qu for questions. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce um, our very distinguished guest speaker this morning, M M Michelle Florlay. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you all for being here. It is wonderful to be back in Australia. I have had the privilege of visiting many times, both in my formerly official capacity and now unofficially. Um, but I always uh, appreciate the, the quality and the value of the, di the strategic dialogue we have as close allies. Uh, given the recent American elections, um, I thought it now was a good time to come over and sort of check signals, if you will, with former colleagues and old friends here in Australia. So this morning I wanted to start by laying out what I see as some of the principal challenges we face um, looking forward to a second term of the Obama administration. And I want to start by giving you some context. Um, it's familiar to all of you, but I think it's an important place to, to start as a reminder of what a President Obama is facing in, in, a, new, in a new term. Um, the first point I would make is that he really faces a very daunting trio of challenges. Um, uh, obviously, he faces a very complex and volatile security environment. Um, as one of my friends recently said, you know, the world does not seem to be cooperating at the moment. Um, we've come out of, we're coming out of a decade of war uh, in, Af in Iraq and now in Afghanistan with a plan for transition in 2014. We see fundamental shifts in the balance of power in this region with the rise of new countries, uh, new powers like China and India that will fundamentally alter uh, the, the future. Uh, we see continued threats from Al Qaeda as it morphs into uh, new forms in, 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 in still threatening regional affiliates. We see the danger of Iran's pursuit of nuclear weapons, um, North Korea's expansion of its nuclear program, and continued proliferation threats in various regions. And we see both the promise and the great uncertainty and turmoil uh, in the Middle East, particularly after the, the Arab Spring. Uh, and then there are, new, there, are, there are growing threats of a different nature, such as the fact that the global commons, the maritime, air, cyber, space domains, are both increasingly congested also increasingly contested. And the list goes on. I could spend 25 minutes going through the list of challenges. But suffice it to say, it's a very daunting um, security environment. At the same time, the second element of the trio is that the president will have to grapple with this at a time of extraordinary budgetary austerity. Um, we, uh, you all know, we've all lived through the global financial crisis, um, the greatest uh, ch economic challenge since the Great Depression, I would, I would argue. Um, and so we are, we are, we've experienced more than a decade uh, of deficit spending in the United States and mounting national debt. And so there's a huge emphasis on the need to make some hard choices to get our economic house back in order. The third uh, element of the trio uh, of challenges uh, that sets the context is the very profound political polarization that we've seen in the United States that, at least before the election, had brought governance to a virtual standstill. The good news is that the, the nature of President Obama's victory in this last election, with the substantial uh, margin in the Electoral College in the United States, 
um, means that I think things have shifted somewhat politically. There is a sense that he has a mandate. There is a new pragmatism when you talk to the leaders of both parties, and they understand the importance of reaching a, a compromise on the budget and moving us forward. So for the first time in a long time, I would say, if, if I had to bet, I actually think we're going to see a budget deal that sets the parameters uh, on revenues and spending and unlocks um, private sector investment that will really get our economy moving again. This is obviously important for the United States domestically, but I would argue it's also very important for American leadership abroad. It will help to nip in the bud some of the, uh, what I would call a pernicious but erroneous narrative of U.S. decline. So with that as the context, President Obama in a second term faces a number of uh, U.S. national security priorities. Uh, these range from trying to prevent Iran's acquisition of nuclear weapons to dealing with the ongoing instability and turmoil in the Middle East, from completing the transition in Afghanistan to sustaining the fight against al-Qaeda around the globe. And I'm happy to talk about any of these when we get to the question and answer period. But today, given that we're here in Australia and given the nature of the U.S.-Australia relationship, I really wanted to focus my comments on another topic, which really is at the top of the list of U.S. national security priorities, and that is continuing the U.S. policy of rebalancing towards Asia-Pacific. If you took the fact that President Obama's first foreign trip after his reelection was to Asia, if you took that as a signal that the rebalancing will continue, you're right. Uh, last year, when President Obama was here in Canberra uh, to address the Australian Parliament, he made clear that the overarching U.S. objective in, in this region is to sustain a stable security environment and, and to help build a regional order in which, the, uh, in which uh, we are, is rooted in economic openness, peaceful resolution of disputes, democratic government, governance, and political freedoms. Uh, and that those things should define the region in the 21st century. But the policy of rebalancing towards Asia really began to take shape long before that speech, really at the very outset of the Obama administration in 2009. The president came into office really understanding the importance of this region to U.S. security and economic growth, particularly as we began the long and difficult process of recovery after the worst economic uh, recession since the Great Depression. After all, when you think about it, Asia accounts for about a quarter of global GDP, and, nearly, and we'll get to nearly 30% by 2015. Nearly 50% of all of global growth outside of the U.S. through 2017. It's about 25% of U.S. exports of goods and services, about 30% of our imports, and an estimated 2.4 million American jobs depend on our exports to Asia, and that number is growing. So, in short, it's U.S. trade and investment in Asia are absolutely critical to our economic recovery and to our long-term economic vitality. I think we also understood uh, that the, the critical and I would argue indispensable role that the U.S. US leadership has played in the region really since World War II, helping to <coughs> underwrite the very stability that has been the foundation of unprecedented economic growth in the region and that, that growth has enabled the rise of new powers like China and India. And we believe that a continued, a continued U.S. stabilizing presence in the region would be just as important in the coming century. From the beginning of uh, his time in office, President Obama recognized that in many ways the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had led the U.S. to underinvest in, in Asia. And so his administration, again, from the outset, pursued an effort to shift more American attention and resources to this region, and within this region, more of our attention to Southeast Asia. So it was really no accident that the first foreign leader uh, that President Obama hosted at the White House was the Japanese foreign minister. The first trip that Secretary Clinton took as Secretary of State was to Asia. The first foreign leader hosted for a state visit uh, at the White House was the Prime Minister of, in of India, and President Obama chose to made a, made a huge effort to get to the East Asia Summit, which was a fairly unprecedented event for an American president. So all of this was meant from the beginning to send a clear diplomatic signal 
uh, that the U.S. does consider itself a Pacific power, um, and we see our interests as inextric in inextricably linked to Asia's security and economy. And we understand that the change in global uh, geop geopolitical realities in the 21st century mean that Asia, more than any other region, will drive our security and well-being. And so it was in this context that the United States laid out the, a multi-dimensional strategy of rebalancing towards Asia. The first element of that was reinvesting to strengthen and modernize our traditional al alliances, Australia, Japan, South Korea, uh, Philippines, and so on. I would say that our, our alliance with Australia is, in particular, is a cornerstone of stability in this part of the world. Um, uh, we, uh, together, our navies patrol the international waterways through which much of the world's trade passes. Our Marines and our Air Forces regularly train together. Our cyber experts work side by side to deal with threats in that domain. Our space communities have just taken several additional steps to further deepen our cooperation in, in that area as well. Afga in Afghanistan, our, our forces stand shoulder to shoulder uh, as they have in just about every conflict in memory. This enduring solidarity, the, uh, the all ever evolving and deepening nature of the alliance uh, is both valuable and very much valued in Washington. And one really only has to go through the recent uh, report or the, the communique out of the Osman meeting to realize how broad and deep our work as allies really is. The second key element of the strategy was trying to forge uh, deeper partnerships with emerging powers across the region uh, and helping to build their capacity to contribute to regional and international security. The third element was engaging more deeply in the region's multilateral institutions, uh, particularly the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, the ADMM Plus, the EAS, in order to promote regional cooperation, peaceful resolution of disputes, adherence to human rights and to international law. The fourth key element of our strategy has been to try to develop a more stable and cooperative and comprehensive relationship with China. China is an absolutely critical partner um, in, a number, in dealing with a number of global challenges, whether it's proliferation in places like Iran and North Korea, or whether it's climate change. There are so many places where we need China's cooperation to be successful as an international community. So the U.S. has been clear that it welcomes China's rise and has encouraged China to become a responsible stakeholder, assuming responsibilities commensurate with its growing national capabilities in a number of areas. Of course, we recognize that there will be elements of both competition and cooperation uh, in this relationship. But wherever possible, we seek to deepen and grow the cooperation and to manage competition where it exists in as healthy a manner as possible. Fifth, uh, the strategy has focused on trying to advance the region's economic architecture. The U.S. has been working with Australia and others to try to create an open economic system in which the rules are very clear and everyone abides by those rules. And so we've been working with our APEC partners trying to reduce barriers to trade. Uh, we've been starting to negotiate a high standards trans-Pacific partnership uh, with a number of regional partners in order to deepen regional economic integration. And lastly, the last element of the rebalancing policy has been to really realign our po military posture in the region, to underwrite uh, the stability that enables economic growth. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you what this does not mean. This does not mean that the U.S. is going to be establishing a ring of permanent base, large uh, military bases around the region. It does mean that we will have a very tailored presence that is strong and flexible, distributed, and sustainable. It means that we'll be shifting more of our naval assets, about 60%, to this region. We will build, be building the U.S. territory of Guam as a strategic hub in the Western Pacific. We will be rotating Marines and Air Force uh, units uh, with Australia on a regular basis to train. We'll be rotating literal combat ships in Singapore for missions like humanitarian assistance and disaster relief and maritime domain awareness. And we'll be sustaining our investments in modernizing our capabilities to ensure that we maintain our freedom of action, uh, our ability to deter and defeat aggression, 
and fundamentally our ability to reassure and support our allies and friends in the region. So to be very clear, um, the bottom line is that rebalancing is not about containing China or any other country. It is about doing our part uh, to help uh, construct a stable 21st century regional order in Asia that is undergirded by clear rules and strong institutions. So as this policy becomes more fully implemented in the coming four years and beyond, we are going to have to confront a number of challenges. First, as I said, the U.S. has to get its economic house in order to be able to sustain this strategic shift. We understand that our economic health and vitality is the foundation of our national security. And so getting this budget deal done is job number one. Um, it's also key, as I mentioned, to reassuring allies and friends and others that you, the U.S. will sustain its leadership position in the region, that, they could, that, that our friends can rely on us um, to have their back in the future. Second challenge that I think we'll face is ongoing, the ongoing turmoil in the Middle East uh, will continue to require a degree of policy focus and resources from the U.S. Now, I don't believe it will prevent the rebalancing, as some have worried, but it will create some near-term resource allocation trade-offs that the U.S. will have to work through. The third challenge is, or the third uh, issue I would, I would say, and it's actually an opportunity rather than a challenge, is that with President Obama's re-election and the leadership transition that's ongoing in China, I think we have a renewed opportunity to engage China, to build a deeper and more cooperative relationship across a number of fronts. I think it's very important that we seek to openly and candidly address China's concerns about the rebalancing towards Asia, not by reversing or abandoning the policy, but by deepening our engagement with them, working with China to clarify what U.S. policy is and what it is not, enhancing our transparency and dialogue between the two governments and particularly between our two militaries, and most importantly, encouraging China to see that it's really in its own economic and strategic interests to fully integrate into the rules-based international order. The fourth challenge I'd highlight as we look forward is that we all have to keep a very watchful eye on what I would call growing nationalism uh, in several of the countries with claims in the South China Sea and East China Sea region. I worry that some of these long festering disputes over sovereignty and, and, and territory have the potential um, in this very resource rich area to erupt into confrontation and that that could escalate through miscalculation into, into full blown conflict. The U.S. has made it very clear time and time again that we do not take a position on the validity of one claim or another from the various countries. But we do consistently stand up for a set of key principles, and that is that these disputes must be resolved peacefully without the resort to force or coercion, and that they need to be resolved in accordance with international law. Now, this underscores some very important work that ASEAN is doing to develop and implement a code of conduct. It also underscores the importance of the U.S. in ratifying the law of the sea. If we are going to be um, trumpeting the importance of international law, then we need to be a full member of the most important treaty uh, uh, that's relevant in this case. Personally, I would also like to see good faith negotiations between the parties to try to actually get at resolving some of the fundamental disputes, or at least to enable joint development that's mutually beneficial. When I look around the world, if, if you can see Russia and the Nordic countries uh, resolving long-standing claims to resource-rich resource waters through negotiation, then why not expect China and the various stakeholders in Southeast Asia to be able to do the same? The last challenge I'll mention is sustaining the domestic political support for the rebounds in the United States and the continued of, uh, investment of resources uh, in, the, in this vital region. Here, I think we have the opportunity to make a very compelling and strategic case to the Congress and the American people. So even in this period of budgetary austerity, I'm very hopeful that we will continue to adequately underwrite the rebalancing. In sum, there's really no higher priority for U.S. national security policy than continuing this shift towards Asia Pacific. There's no policy to which President Obama is more committed 
and more personally invested. And there's no element of strategy that has more bipartisan support uh, in the U.S. So let me close by just giving you a few thoughts on what does this mean for defense? What does this mean for the U.S. military? We are certainly, it's very clear that we have, uh, we are facing the end of an era of unprecedented growth in defense spending. But it's still unclear whether we will see further cuts in defense spending as a result of the budget deal. Whatever the spending levels, the fo I think the focus of the Pentagon will be on s maintaining the U United States military as the best military in the world and ensuring that the U.S. has the ability to deal with aggression in more than one theater at a time if necessary. That has been a hallmark of U.S. strategy for decades and that must be a hallmark um, in the future. Uh, I think that uh, you will see a sm somewhat smaller U.S. military with the reduction in our ground forces to pre-Iraq levels. Remember, we grew the Army and the Marine Corps in order to sustain the rotations to those two conflicts. Now that they, we are transitioning out of uh, Afghanistan in the coming years, we'll go to a slightly smaller ground forces, but still very agile, very flexible, full-spectrum forces. Even in the time of budgetary constraint, you will see us protecting our investments in cutting-edge capability areas that we think will be critical to future warfare, whether it is maintaining our investment in special operations forces, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, unmanned and autonomous systems, um, uh, capabilities to deal with uh, area, area uh, access denial, area denial, uh, space, cyberspace, precision, precision strike, and so forth. I think one of the challenges that, as you see us uh, draw down the size of the force somewhat, is that we have to try to avoid the mistakes of the past. In every other U.S. drawdown that we've ever seen historically, we have essentially hollowed out the force, meaning we've kept uh, too large a force structure and not enough investment in readiness and modernization to make that capability of the force what it needs to be. So we will be keeping an eye on that and doing our best to avoid that. And lastly, I think we've embraced um, a notion called, that we call reversibility. You know, I had the great honor of working with uh, Secretary Bob Gates, um, who was, I think, one of the greatest, will go down in the history as one of the greatest U.S. Secretaries of Defense, but he was also um, cut his teeth as an intelligence analyst. And he had about zero uh, percent confidence in our ability to predict the future. Um, when you think, uh, as good as our intelligence community is, I mean, you think of the number of wars that we have fought in places that we never thought we would be fighting. And so his point was always, the, 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 the U.S. military can't exactly know where it's going to end up protecting our interests in the future, so it has to be agile, it has to be adaptable. And we embrace this notion of rever reversibility, and that is, what if we get it wrong? What if our assumptions are wrong? How do we adjust? And so we're giving a lot of thinking to how we structure our Guard and Reserve forces to give us um, some hedge against risk. We're thinking a lot about how we size and structure our industrial base to enable rapid um, uh, you know, sort of reallocation of resources, again, if we, if we get a, uh, the future wrong. And we're even thinking about personnel management, about things like should you keep a disproportionately large number of field grade officers because it's very easy to grow units quickly if you have the leadership, but you can't grow the leadership quickly. The last thing I'll say is, um, you know, as if we do have to take further cuts in defense, I think it is very important that we try to avoid solving the budgetary problem on the backs of the force in terms of cutting personnel and force structure and modernization and readiness. Having spent at least more than eight years of my life in the Pentagon, I can assure you um, that we have too much overhead in our headquarters structure, that we have more infrastructure than we need for the force of the future, that we are uh, very inefficient in how we deliver health care to military members and their families, that we have a long way to go in transforming our business practices, our logistics and maintenance and so forth, and that we are still very much um, in progress in trying to reform our acquisition system to give us true value for taxpayer dollars. So, um, you know, we will need a lot of buy-in from Congress, but with the right leadership, I think those are the areas where we should be focusing on cost reduction before we turn to further cut capabilities uh, in the force. 
Now, I have a sneaking suspicion that there might be some parallels between the U.S. and Australian situations on, on some of the defense spending and defense challenges we face. So I, I do look forward to discussing that further in Q&A. But let me wrap up my formal remarks there and open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle, for that very comprehensive and insightful analysis of current directions in American foreign and defence policy. You've touched on a number of rich veins here, and I'm sure there's a lot of questions that people will want to ask. We'll have about 15 minutes, because I know people have to get to their day, their day jobs, but the floor is open. I'd ask if people could um, identify themselves and their affiliation, and then ask a, a brief question, because I'm sure we'll have a lot. So the floor is open. Please. And I'll come to you. So, go on start the Department of Africa. Obama and Africa and uh, the policy and the military posture, if you like, in regard to Africa, if you would. So, I think uh, there's been a real focus in this administration on working to build capacity in Africa, certainly in, in sort of traditional development terms, but also in, in military terms. A lot of what we are doing in Africa is particularly using our special forces, but also um, conventional units, to work with African militaries to build their capacity to better secure their own uh, territories and to meet the needs of uh, populations. Um, I think the most acute challenge we face in Africa right now is the, um, the morphing of some of Al-Qaeda's affiliates, if you will. Um, we've seen Al-Qaeda seek to really gain a, a territorial uh, footing in a place like Yemen. Um, we've seen them working with Al-Shabaab in Somalia. We now see them making a move in Mali uh, with AQIM. And so, Given that many we have seen active plotting in those regional affiliates against the United States homeland, obviously that has put these groups on the U.S. radar screen. The first, the preferred approach, the the the, the first line of effort is to work with those countries to build their capacity to confront the problem on their territory. When necessary, if we see an imminent threat coming from one of these groups, the U.S. may take. Uh, whatever necessary action to thwart that plot in that moment in, a, in an urgent manner. But I think the long-term solution is building capacity and working closely with with um, those militaries. Here we this is a is a coalition effort. Uh, we have our partners in the UK and in France and others who have deep relationships um, on the continent. They are also very much um, a part of this building capacity effort. In the Navy's Department of Defense, I'm just wondering how is Europe, principally NATO, reacting to the rebalance? Because obviously the forces that were once in Europe are now heading towards Asia. So one of the reasons we had a huge debate in the in, you know to air some dirty laundry, uh, we we had a huge debate in our agency about whether to use the word rebalance or pivot. Um, we're now using both, but I argued against pivot because pivot sounds like you're actually turning your back, you know, in turning towards Asia, you're turning your back on someone else and the Europeans think that's them. So, you know, the truth is, look, NATO is uh, one of our most important um, set of alliance relationships. Wherever we fight, we tend to fight alongside our NATO allies. Um, uh, maintaining, uh, seeing our European uh, allies maintain strong defense, maintain interoperability with us, um, that is in, in, incredibly uh, important. And so I actually don't think, there, there are not forces that are coming out of Europe and going to Asia. Um, we are bringing some ground forces home um, from Europe and those forces will likely actually go away. Those will likely be part of the, the ground force reductions that we are taking 
overall. But at the same time, we've made it clear to our European par uh, partners that we are reinvesting and updating um, our support for the alliance. So we are working on ballistic missile defense together with the phased adaptive approach. We are deepening our relationships on cybersecurity, um, on WMD uh, counterproliferation. We are actually, even as we bring some of our heavier forces home, increasing um, the U.S. commitment uh, to the NATO response force and to rotational training. So I think all in all, uh, when it, it, at the end of the day, I don't think the European allies will feel a big gap or a huge change or a huge absence of American forces. We will stay committed. We'll keep working with them because we know they are among our, you know, they are our, are among our closest allies, and we we certainly want to keep those relationships strong. Louise Marrington, Department of Defence. Uh, the, the term Indo-Pacific is becoming quite common in the Australian national security discourse at the moment. Is this a term that is also being used in the US? And if so, how is it commonly defined? You know, I have not seen um, the term used as much in the US as it is out here in the region. But I think it's an important concept in that, you know, as we think about, um, you know, investing in stability, securing uh, lines of communication, securing uh, freedom of navigation and so forth, we need to think not only about the Strait of Malacca and, mm -hmm. and the, the, the waterways to the east, we also need to think about the Indian Ocean and the waterways that connect Asia and Africa. So I think it's a, it's a useful concept to remind people that we, the Indian Ocean also really matters. Um, and so, uh, I won't, you know, hazard to try to d give you my own personal definition, but I do think it's a valuable concept. Uh, George Brown from National Security College. You've talked about um, the desirability of avoiding perceptions of containment, managing cooperation, and um, limiting competition. I'm interested in what you think will need to be the hallmarks of US behaviour in convincing the region generally and, and China that it's not rhetorical? I think there are a number of things we need to do. Um, one is to really uh, walk the walk on transparency and to um, be as open and candid with China about explaining what it is we are doing. One of my last interactions with my Chinese counterpart um, in our bilateral defense talks um, was an effort to actually um, uh, demystify some of our uh, reconnaissance operations in and around China. I think the Chinese had the perception that we were focusing on them in terms of reconnaissance operations like we focused on the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So one of the things I was able to do is I went to our intelligence community, and this, this was not easy, but I um, was like pulling teeth, but I said, look, we need to declassify some numbers here. So I want you to, sh I want first to show when we were in a Cold War and trying to contain the Soviet Union, what percentage of our strategic reconnaissance operations were focused on so the Soviet Union in various categories. And then I want you to do the same analysis today for China. And what I was able to show them is when it was in the Cold War and we were containing the Soviet Union, it was 98% you know, of this and it's 96% of that. I mean, we were trying to, we, this was in support of a policy of containment. When I took today's, globe, looked at the global reconnaissance operations um, today, and I showed the Chinese the percentage in different categories, the highest percentage of the U.S. activity was 8%, the lowest was 3%. I mean, this is a small, f we, I was able to say, look, put this in perspective. If we were trying, if containment was really our intention, these numbers would look like they used to look in the Soviet Union. That's not what's happening today, and it's not our intent. So I think it's little things like that, piece by piece, to try to say, look, if that were our policy, we would be behaving in a different way. If that were our policy, we would be seeking to create large US permanent bases around Asia. That's not what we're trying to do. It's not what's going to happen. So I think there's a lot of that. And the second piece is really 
investing in the engagement in terms that are more real. You've seen now China has just been invited to participate in RIMPAC, which is the largest US-hosted multilateral exercise in the region. We need to do more of that. We need to do more real-world exercises, even coordinated operations like counter-piracy or humanitarian assistance and so forth with China to try to build some trust between the two military institutions. One on the left, Christina, up there, and then one on the right. Hey, Ross from Education. Uh, would any uh, cuts in your defense spending, would, would it see a reduction in your troops based in South Korea or any other countries like Japan or Philippines? Thanks. I don't think you'll see any significant, um, certainly no reductions or, uh, and probably no significant shifts in our posture in Northeast Asia. We have long-standing commitments to both Japan and South Korea. Those are obviously being updated, so we're working with Japan on ballistic missile defense, where we work with um, Korea in new areas as well. But there's no, as we, as we create more of a rotational presence in Southeast Asia, it's not that we're moving forces from the north-south, it's really that we're just enabling globally deployed forces to rotate through the Southeast Asia region more, more frequently. So I think we've reassured both Japan and Korea that our commitment to them remains the same and that they should not expect any diminution of our presence there. James Brown from the Lowy Institute in Sydney. Thanks very much for your speech and also thank you for your work on CNAS, which I'm a yeah. big fan of and have yeah, greatly admired their work. Um, I wanted to ask you about US views on the role of Indonesia um, going forward. Is it just as the leader of ASEAN or do you see a, a bigger security role for Indonesia? I think uh, Indonesia, given uh, its, its geography, its demographics, its importance in the region is, is a, a critical partner. Um, certainly the role it's played in ASEAN has been invaluable and I hope you know, will continue to be so in the future. Um, but I also think that um, they have the potential to contribute more uh, to regional security in terms of building their own capacity for maritime domain awareness uh, and uh, securing um, their, uh, the, the waters around them. Um, in terms of contributing troops uh, and forces to international missions and international training and exercises. So I would like to see um, Indonesia, Indonesia becoming even more integrated in the security sphere and contributing more as it, it sort of uh, emerges more fully as a power. Christina, just over there. I know that it's not all about China, but for a lot of your regional partners, it is. You'll see that in South China Sea, the Philippines, um, some of Japan's moves, uh, and also within ASEAN. If it is, to a large degree, focused on China for the United States regional partners, how do you think the United States should handle its relationship with China via those partners? Uh, when you say via, can you explain? Yeah, so if there too? the United States, if we pulled into a conflict in South China Sea, yeah. it isn't really going to be based on a, a direct conflict between China and the United States. It's going to be a irrational move by right. the Philippines yes. or something by Vietnam. It'll be Japan trying to pull you right. into a trilateral right. Got it. maritime exercise. Right. So okay. that's what I'm sort of Got saying it. is a lot of the times you don't have the ability to control that it yeah. isn't all about China. Correct. So I think, you know, we um, are working very hard to reassure our allies and partners of our presence and our commitment to their defense and to the stability of the region. But at the same time, we have to be careful to also um, not to inadvertently uh, embolden them to take provocative action. Um, I think we've seen a recent chapter of this, frankly, where you had um, uh, some of, uh, in, particularly in the Philippines, some uh, an, uh, the Philippines mistaking U.S. support for an opportunity to be much more assertive in, a, in, in staking their claims. I think we have to be very careful that we don't feed that dynamic. And so I think it's important to say, um, 
you know, again, we stand up for these principles that no one should be using force or coercion, no one should be provo provoking, no one should be um, transgressing international law um, in these situations. Um, and I think it's, we have to have a very candid set of conversation with, not only with China, but also with our friends and allies about the best way to um, uh, approach uh, dealing with some of these disputes. Uh, because I do think there, there is a danger of some of our friends occasionally um, misreading uh, or, or miscalculating in terms of uh, the, the support that they have from the United States. Thank you. Marine and Service from Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, changing the topic a little bit, under Secretary Clinton, we've seen very strong leadership on development and gender issues internationally by the US. To what extent do you think that'll be continued in the second Obama administration, and how will it play out in some of the, uh, some of the emerging areas, such as Myanmar, post-2014 Afghanistan, and elsewhere that the US is involved? Uh, certainly, Secretary Clinton has done an amazing job championing this issue and really raising its visibility internationally. But I think the commitment goes beyond her personally to one of the administration, and the, and the President has spoken eloquently on this issue as well. I think one of the biggest impacts that it's had is really um, helping to uh, inform our own, uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, development efforts, um, really focusing on empowering women as a driver of uh, economic development and the development of civil society in many of these um, countries. So I would expect the, um, the focus to continue. Um, I hope that whoever the next Secretary of State is will have the, be as, as effective a spokesperson um, on this set of issues because I, I do think they're very important and very impactful going forward. Michelle, thank you again from me for an uh, interesting presentation. I'm Brendan O'Loughman from uh, the Sir Richard Williams Foundation. When I first met you in the Pentagon, you were a somewhat e expert on um, an issue that you haven't spoken much of, and that was uh, strategic policy. You're working with Frank Miller on arms mm -hmm. control, threat reduction, and you were the, the go-to girl on all that <laughs> in uh, the Pentagon. What, what do you think now, looking back, uh, the administration has been criticised in not achieving its rhetoric in arms control, uh, but then again, that's par for the course. Um, so in the Asian region, there are a couple of uh, traditional worry areas, but they don't feature very largely on your discussion. What do you think about it looking back now? So I think, you know, President Obama did not shy away from embracing a very um, bold and I would argue aspirational vision of you know, a world without nuclear weapons. But he was also very clear that um, it was going to take quite a long time and a lot of effort to get there, and that several preconditions would have to be put in place. I do think that, you know, the administration spent a fair amount of political capital getting the next round of arms control, the New START Treaty, through our Senate and fully ratified and so forth, so that we could um, show, do our part, if you will, in bringing our, the strategic arsenals of uh, the U.S. and Russia down. I think one of the things that not en you know, has not gotten enough um, attention is the work that's been happening um, largely out of the glare of the media at these nuclear security summits, where we have been working with various countries in coalition to really police up a lot of the weapons usable nuclear material that is in research reactors and elsewhere around the world to substantially reduce the risk of nuclear terrorism. Um, I think um, on some of the more um, persistent and challenging nonproliferation cases like North Korea and Iran, again, um, I think there's, there's been a lot of, uh, in, there, in, in, in the case of Iran, there's a very laser-like focus on prevention, um, the building of the international sanctions regimes, the, the pursuit of P5 plus one negotiations, and I think that will continue to play out, and I think as the sanctions bite more deeply, you will, I hope, see some progress on that. North Korea has been really tough. 
um, we've seen in a period of their own leadership transition, um, the focus has been on trying to prevent any kind of provocative action that might, uh, provocations that is, uh, of the sort we've seen in the past that might actually spark conflict on the peninsula, um, but also looking to set the conditions for renewed negotiations uh, in the six-party talks. Um, I don't think those conditions have been set yet, but I think behind the scenes, again, it's been a real, it has been a focus of this administration's effort trying to get to that point. Um, meanwhile, you've seen, I think, a lot of progress in new countries joining the Proliferation Security Initiative. We've had, again, a number of un unpublicized cases where proliferation shipments have been stopped due to the coordinated action of a number of countries in Southeast Asia in particular. We've got time for one more question if there's, if anyone wishes to ask it. Down here, please, Dan. Uh, thanks, Jason Deutsch from the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. You mentioned that one of the challenges to the um, US rebalance is to sustain domestic political support in the US. Um, how do you think that that can be achieved, particularly given that most people would be more concerned about the fiscal situation and might not appreciate what the US's role in this region is as a sort of American citizen. Yeah. I think um, there, there, there are two elements to making the case. Um, one is reminding people of the history of this region and the role that the US has played in creating the stability that has enabled uh, a lot of the economic growth of, of this region. And two is to remind people in very concrete terms of the interconnectedness of the US economy and US jobs with the economy and trade uh, with Asia. So, um, and I think the more you unpack that, the more Americans get it. Um, the other issue thing is that I don't think, um, you know, a lot of the investment that we will make to support the uh, rebalancing is diplomatic time and effort, it's economic negotiation time and effort, and to the extent it's investment militarily, a lot of those investments we would be making anywhere, anyway, just to keep the U.S. military uh, one that has, you know, a leading edge in the future. And so I don't think there are huge, huge additional marginal costs, if you will, or additional costs associated with the rebounds that we wouldn't, investments that we wouldn't be making anyway. So, but I do think we have to connect the dots very clearly for the American people, particularly on the economic issues, to sustain the bipartisan support that's there. Thank you very much, Michelle. And um, for someone that only arrived in Australia from the United States yesterday, that was a <laughs> remarkably lucid, uh, comprehensive uh, and insightful analysis of both the challenges and the opportunities uh, that confront the second Obama administration, particularly in terms of its relationship uh, with the Asia-Pacific region. There are very few people, actually, that uh, combine a, a background which has a distinguished academic career, um, a high-level involvement in uh, the think tank world, uh, and a very high-level involvement uh, in the development of strategic policy uh, in the context of budget constraints. And uh, Michelle has brought that background to bear on the issues that now uh, confront the second Obama administration, and in many respects, uh, Australian public policy. So uh, we're very appreciative of the time you've made available this morning. Uh, we particularly are grateful for the insight you brought to these issues. Um, it's an imposing agenda for both our countries um, and for the wider region. And I think you distilled the essence of that in a remarkably clear and lucid way. So I'd ask everyone to join with me in thanking Michelle. I'd just like, before I let you all scoot to your day jobs, to, uh, to thank everybody that's made this occasion possible this morning, particularly uh, to the Australian New Zealand School of Government, with whom we've hosted um, this occasion, uh, to Boston Consulting Group um, for, for their support, um, for all of the support that you've given here by your presence today. Um, 
which I know in some respects is a little bit un-Australian, as I said at the start, but I think the, the turnout we could have filled as many times over. Um, I think it reflects both the quality of uh, the present presenter and the topicality of the, of the issues. Um, so thank you very much for coming and I'd, I'd ask you to keep in touch with our website um, and ANSOGS in terms of uh, future occasions such as this. I'd also in a very practical way like to thank um, uh, particularly Christina Tan and the other members of the National Security College and ANSOG uh, who have done the very hard logistical work in making these occasions happen. So thank you all again for coming and we look forward to the next occasion.